So hi, Kira. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would just want to introduce you as a filmmaker and director behind um, this wonderful short film, Harrier, which we'll be discussing today. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm so glad to, um, to be here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start by asking you, so for someone that didn't get the chance to see Harrier at wild screen, um, how would you sort of distill it and summarize it um, uh, just for someone who hasn't seen it before? I mean, I think in a broad sense, um, to me at least, it's about the healing properties and catharsis of nature, especially when it comes to mental health and um, just the human spirit. And I think it's specifically focused on one woman and you know her really incredible journey um, and her recovery from addiction, uh, from alcohol and how bird watching in particular, but nature in a broader sense really, really helped aid in her recovery. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I really got that sense throughout the film. I was wondering um, if this is a topic you are particularly drawn to because you personally felt like nature has a very healing capacity for yourself or were there other aspects that drew you to this topic? I mean, if I'm being completely honest, I had never ventured into the world of natural, uh, you know, natural world for making wildlife really? filmmaking before ever. And I, I it's still quite uh, crazy to me now because a lot of the festivals, um, you know, that my film uh, has been screened in have, have been very much like natural history and, and wildlife based, which is kind of nuts because I feel like a bit of an imposter. <laughs> um, but I think what ultimately drew me to it was I mean, in a kind of uh, logistical sense, I wanted to make a film during lockdown uh, that was incredibly difficult under the restrictions that were mm. uh, happening currently at the time. Uh, you weren't allowed to kind of film indoors at all. So I thought, what if I made something outdoors? What if I filmed something outdoors with somebody? And you know, then that would kind of mitigate those restrictions. And I just thought, well, what if I spoke to somebody who had a particular connection with the outdoors? I mean, at that time, especially, I think we were all um, feeling, uh, I think, incredibly, uh, I don't know. I think, I, think, I think a lot of us were under a lot of, of, of mental health kind of stresses within you know, the kind of lockdown. So I think a lot of us were drawn to the outdoors and nature as, as a form of kind of catharsis and as a form of, of uh, you know, being able to actually breathe. And that was definitely, uh, you know, applicable for me. And like, I felt during that time, you know, the kind of only respite you would get was getting out and going for a walk, <laughs> maybe. Mm -hmm. And so that was also definitely part of it. But so it was kind of a combination of, of, of you know, wanting to make a film, the logistics of making a film, and then also definitely feeling this kind of renewed connection to the outdoors and then wanting to maybe find somebody who had um who had a really uh, a touching and and you know kind of evocative connection with the outdoors and it was quite it, i didn't really know what i was going to find but i just wanted to find somebody who maybe had something um mm -hmm. that i could make a film about in that sense Mm -hmm. And it's those like really wonderful personal stories and like overcoming challenges, which are so such sort of like gold for um, documentary filmmakers. How did you find your lovely contributor, Joan? I got so, so lucky, honestly. And I, um, I think every film I've made before, I've always had some sort of connection with the contributor that I mm -hmm. kind of based the film around. So this is the first time I believe that I've actually just kind of found someone that I had no pre-existing connection with and that was difficult in a kind of larger sense because I think the, the ground that she was covering was so vulnerable um, and, and the topics that were covered in the film was so sensitive so it was quite uh, you know quite a difficult thing to broach that um, with someone that you you had no pre-existing relationship with from both sides you know filmmaker and mm -hmm. contributor but I essentially just put a call out on a few Facebook groups I was trying to find somebody um, uh, nearby to me. So I live in Edinburgh. I was trying to find somebody close by. And I just posted in just like as many little groups as I could find. And she actually got in touch with me. She really, really stuck out to me because from the get go, she was so raw and so honest and so open about her story. And I think I just got this really gut instinct that she was the person um, who was going to be at the center of the story. And so you mentioned that you'd made other films before um, and that you'd often known the contributors. Um, could you talk me through like your directorial experience? Like how is this different from your pre previous experience? And and again, you're saying like you're, you're moving into natural history. Like how did that challenge you as a director? 
<laughs> I still see myself or, or um, consider myself, you know, very much learning the ropes as, as a director. Um, you know, it, it still feels weird to call myself a, a, a filmmaker, but I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. But, <laughs> you know, in the few films I've made before, it's been because I feel like I've just stumbled upon really interesting people. And a lot of the times they've just been people who are very, very close to me. As somebody who's really obsessive with, you know, human stories and documentary, every single time I meet someone, I kind of immediately think, wow, what aspect of your life would I make a film about if I were to make a film about you? Which is maybe a bit strange, but that's kind of been the approach when I've been speaking and, and meeting people before. So um, I've been, I've been, you know, I guess really lucky to, um, to have people close to me that have opened up a lot of the time and allowed me to kind of film aspects of their of their lives but um you know as as a, as a filmmaker I, would, I really wanted to challenge myself to, to to really step away from that and actually find a story completely separate to me about something that i knew nothing about because that's a part of i think documentary that i really really love is this idea that as you're making the film you're learning about something and i mm -hmm. think going going forwards that's really something i'd like to continue doing is, is finding topics that i'm interested in but i don't really have any knowledge of selfishly mm -hmm. i like to just learn about things i feel like i'm quite a nosy <laughs> quite a nosy person that that, <laughs> that probably helps me uh, uh, you know a bit but the kind of foray into wildlife filmmaking natural um you know kind of the natural world i really didn't didn't see that it was never something um you know beyond just the general appreciation one has for nature and the outdoors especially living in scotland uh, you know really surrounded by it. i feel incredibly lucky um i i don't think I had any particular draw to it necessarily but it was this very human story I think that that drew me to it and and I still think whilst you know the the natural world nature is you know a big character within the film um you know I think I think it's it's Joan and and her very human struggle that's at the core of it mm -hmm. And how long did it take you to sort of build this relationship with Joan? You said you met on Facebook, but you got into some really, really personal stories um, that I'm sure are very emotional to go over for her. Like, how did you build that relationship and work around those those tricky patches? Well, again, you know, I think I, I really would like to um, sing her praises as, as a, like an incredibly brave and 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 vulnerable um contributor because a lot of a lot of the topics that were brought up were of her own volition um and you know at points i think it was this weird kind of like ethical dilemma where i was like i i don't know if i should necessarily feature that it almost feels too raw for somebody that i don't actually have like a familial connection to that i've only met a few months ago um, but I think being really open and having this transparency between, you know, contributor and filmmaker definitely helped um, in terms of the creative process. And I think it also helped um, build our relationship by, and this is probably circumstantial because of COVID, but it was just me basically doing all of the technical roles. Like I was interviewing her and I was doing camera and I was doing, you know, sound recording. So mm. it was just me and just her. And I think that probably helps form a bit of a, you know, a bit of a stronger connection quicker than if there'd been a bigger crew. Yeah. And um, we also filmed everything in a, a nearby nature reserve to her. So it was very much her domain. Um, so I think that probably helped her feel a bit more comfortable as, as well. But we filmed for about sporadically over the course of about five months. And I had okay. hours and hours and hours and hours of footage um, to kind of go through. But I think that was necessary in getting mm -hmm. that story and allowing us to both form a connection with one another. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it comes across in the film that you spend so much time sort of like getting to know her because it does feel so personal. It almost feels like you're having that conversation with her. I wanted to move on to sort of like your stylistic approach because I'm really intrigued by your sort of colour grading, that there's some really gorgeous reds that sort of crop up here and there. Like what's your thinking behind that? Um, so I think, <laughs> I think um, that's probably the stylistic element of the film that I'm probably like most most proud of um in in a lot of ways because it was intentional <laughs> basically it wasn't just because it looked cool um i think i i think i was trying to to represent the story in in a visual sense just in the way that it's you know it's grounded in nature but mm -hmm. the very 
I don't know, at the very at the very core of it is is this quite dark and tumultuous story. Um, and I think I wanted to represent that in the visual style by taking shots of nature and flipping, you know, flipping them on their heads in a, in a way. So to try and make our, um, the perception of nature that we would usually have uh, quite uncanny. And I, I think I wanted to do that by making it unsettling, changing it to a strange grade, making it red instead of green to try mm -hmm. and I guess bring out the the, the, the kind of the darkness and um, yeah, just the kind of the, the uneasiness of, of the story beneath it. Because it's really beautiful, the connection she has with nature, but it comes from quite a disturbing place. Mm -hmm. And I thought a way to kind of uh, to kind of emulate that in, in the shots would be to, to maybe just slightly warp the the traditional views of nature that we would we would usually have mm -hmm. and i thought that sort of dark uneasiness came across in the sound design as well did you particularly work on that to, to make that feeling come across there as well yeah well i think i wanted to make it as kind of stark as possible there's not much uh there's not you know i think there, there's a few little bits of, of sound design and music in there but it's incredibly subtle and i think mm -hmm. i quite liked the silence i quite liked the um obviously i used quite a lot of of uh, night vision footage as well where i could i very much used the the sound from from that because there's there's a lack of human presence that makes it quite unsettling it's you know almost demonic in a sense seeing these these you know beautiful animals that during the day belong in a disney film but at night time when there's no people around it just feels incredibly uh, disturbing and unsettling um but but yeah i think i purposely kept it like as stark as i possibly could uh, because i quite liked the idea of just sitting and i think throughout the the entire film um there's like a looping bird tracks of the, the only consistency in terms of sound is just a uh, bird song and bird mm -hmm. sound and I just kind of recorded that and I looped it throughout the entire time because I guess that was just I wanted a constant presence of the outdoors and that was kind of the way to do that but other than that there was I wanted to keep it as, as still as possible to really I think hear what she was saying because it's a lot of talking it's a lot of testimony and I really wanted that to resonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think what you said, um, it really reminds me of, you know, when you're in a tent at night and you can just hear the world around you and there's no human noise and it becomes eerie because all these sounds sort of like build up to something in your head. I felt like when you were using the sort of night vision and the sound that went with that, it, it really had that eerie feel to it. Thank you. That was definitely like, I think the intention. And I, and I think I got, I got really, really lucky because a lot of the, I basically put a call out on, um, on social media I reached out to a bunch of like trail camera companies I ended up finding one in America that was really great that sent me a ton of footage that they were like okay you know totally happy with you using this mm -hmm. um and and there were a few incredible bits in there that were really really striking like the deer's kind of rutting I think that's probably yeah. my my favorite shot <laughs> in the film um probably because it's one that I have nothing to do with but <laughs> that I think the sound from that is is incredible um and yeah, it was just really, really powerful, I think. Uh -huh. You've talked about social media a lot in a way that you've sort of like found contributors and collected um, some of your footage. Is it a tool that you're thinking you're gonna use to sort of like spread your film and it, do you have sort of an impact plan for it? Is that something you're thinking of doing? I really just wanted Joan to be happy with it. That was my, you know, first and foremost, that was it. I was like, well, if she's, if she's pleased with it, um, that was the scariest thing to me because you know you're taking someone's history you're taking someone's you know it's a retrospective piece it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's somebody reflecting over like the past 30 years of their life and you're trying to distill that into a 15 minute film um and also i had just met her so i i felt really scared and that was probably the, the main thing that i wanted was for her to be super happy with it so beyond that the fact that it's kind of you know gone to so many festivals and allowed me to screen it um you know for loads of peers in the industry that that's been incredible in terms of long long-term impact i haven't actually even really considered it because everything's just felt like really exciting <laughs> you know um, and, and unexpected but i think you know in the long term um I think I'd, I'd love for people to see it and maybe see themselves in it in some capacity, whether or not it's from a mental health standpoint or from, you know, if it if it's helps a community of people that are recovering from alcoholism, that would obviously be incredible. I know that's what Joan wanted um, potentially for the film's impact to be. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm just kind of taking it as it comes and, and, and just being really excited with all the places it's gone so far, you know? Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you did show it to Joan? What did she think? Oh yeah, that was scary. Um, I think I've been so, we've been in such close contact that I don't, I wasn't, I would have been shocked if she was like, wow, this is completely terrible, <laughs> you know, just because I, I felt, I felt like I felt yeah. um, quite close to her in a sense. But it was definitely really nerve wracking, you know, for what I said before. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really scary to, to take somebody's full story, especially when they have um, been so incredibly vulnerable um, and open and honest with you. And, you know, it's your kind of duty to represent that in, in a light that that person feels is correct, you know. Um, but she really, um, seemed to love it which was amazing um it premiered at uh, glasgow short film festival and she came to that with her wonderful husband alistair um mm -hmm. and that was a that was a really incredible moment just kind of i felt that was the proudest i think i felt because it was just being like oh you know i'm so glad that mm -hmm. you've i'm so honored that you've trusted me with your story and mm -hmm. i'm so happy to be able to you know show it um you know on a big screen that's that's really exciting and mm -hmm. i think I think it's probably quite strange for her, but you know, I think it meant a lot to her and it meant a huge amount to me. So that was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And do you have any sort of like favorite stories from behind the scenes when you were making this or when you were developing your relationship with Joan? Oh, you know, probably going and all of the mast interviews were filmed in um, a nature reserve uh, called Borsinch and it's 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 in it's an Edinburgh and it's um, one that Joan loves to go to she frequents it I think she spent most of her lockdown time there mm -hmm. and um, after we would film we'd often just kind of walk around and I think I remember one day in particular um, I think it was coming up to summer and there were just loads of butterflies around and I think she just started talking about the kind of rarity of this one specific type of butterfly and we kind of went butterfly hunting and I think I actually had like a meeting later that day that I ended up missing because I completely lost track of time because I got so like <laughs> embedded and I think you know that's that's the thing especially you know <laughs> as a younger kind of generation it's like you're very chronically online and to just kind of have that set aside for a minute and actually just enjoy hunting butterflies you know with someone who knows a lot about butterflies was just really lovely <laughs> so that was you know i think all all of the odd times that i really really um loved i thought that was you know really really great opportunity and i feel like i actually learned a lot about about um wildlife in general from her so and bird watching in particular mm -hmm. is that now like a hobby of yours are you an avid bird watcher or were you before <laughs> even? <laughs> I wasn't before. Um, I, I knew a, a wee bit about birds, but um, it's just because my dad's a, a really into birds. But um, I mean, I think I've got a, a, a really renewed, um, I think, appreciation for the outdoors. And one thing she always said to me was she kind of said, oh, you know, people walk along and especially now, like people just always listen to music and they're not actually listening to what's around them and now mm. i think i just make a really conscientious effort when i'm walking anywhere because i walk a lot i actually never listen to music anymore i just even if i'm in the middle of the city um which i am because i live in edinburgh but um whenever i'm walking around especially through kind of like um more kind of green areas i always um just really try to make an effort to, to listen out for stuff that's going on and make make an effort to, to really appreciate the outdoors because you know it's really beautiful <laughs> mm -hmm. and there's so much urban wildlife that we just miss because we've got our heads down yeah. looking at our phones i know i'm bad for that so i feel like that's a tip i need to take from joan as well it's true you know we we kind of mm -hmm. block off to, to the to the beautiful you know because it's not you know it's, it's it's all around us um as cliche as that really sounds <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i've just tried to kind of appreciate um you know what is what is around um, no, when I'm kind of out and about and that's that's really I think it's been it's been quite like settling actually in a lot of ways it's very mm -hmm. um it's very calming mm -hmm. um so as a filmmaker like what's next for you where are you heading do you think you'll stay with a bit of natural history or are you jumping around to other genres <laughs> that's a good question um you know I think even before um making this film I visually as as a kind of like uh as a filmmaker I've always really gravitated towards the outdoors um in mm -hmm. terms of you know visuals and i've i've in a lot of the projects i've done before have been um heavily you know featuring uh natural and you know wild elements 
So I think I've actually always really taken inspiration from the natural world without even really thinking about it. So I think mm -hmm. I'll always continue to do that because, you know, there's such an obvious, you know, but really profound beauty in those that type of imagery. Um, and I think I'll continue to, to definitely gravitate towards that type of type of imagery. But, you know, I think as, as a documentary filmmaker, my my I think passion and my obsession with it has always been around like human stories and a human element and the mm -hmm. human spirit and you know human piece of like perseverance that's always been I think the stories that I've really really wanted to tell so I think um human centric but with the natural element natural visuals going forwards but um yeah I'm currently working on uh, a film actually about uh, spiritualism and fortune telling <laughs> which is completely different to what you know mm -hmm. I've just made um, but I think I was interested in probably again in like quite a broad sense uh, this weird uncertainty that we all find ourselves in at the moment and people who um, seek kind of assurance through uh, seek kind of reassurance through supernatural means. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was that was something that really retracted me to that story. So that's something I'm currently working on. Brilliant. And if everyone wants to sort of like follow along with your filmmaking journey and see what you do next, um, how would you like them to contact you or how can they stay in contact with you? Um, well, uh, best to contact me probably through, uh, I've got a website, which is just kiraflint.com um, and Instagram, I'm probably most active there. Um, I think my at is at Flintapole. Um, and yeah, probably one of those means Kira, thank you so much for joining us today and chatting about your film Harrier. Um, if anyone who's been watching wants to watch your film, is there anywhere that they can go to do it? Will it be in more festivals? Well, I'm hoping for it to go into a few more festivals. Um, it's actually going to Kendall Mountain Festival, which I'm really excited about. But um, if anyone wants to watch it, they can just get in touch with, um, by the contact box on my website, which is www.kiraflint.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to seeing what fantastic films you make in the future. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here.